I am delighted to welcome you all here tonight to the Hoover Library, and I'm delighted to introduce Jeff Miller, uh, who will be talking about his new book, World War I Crusaders, shameless product plug. Uh, I have known Jeff for nearly 10 years. Uh, as a writer living in Denver, he called me October 4, or sent me an email, October 14, 2010, uh, explaining a book project uh, involving the CRB and his grandfather. Uh, as, a, as an archivist, I can put my hands on the sheet paper. I'm so proud. Um, and he was going to write a, 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 a biography and history about the CRB and focus on uh, Milton Brown, his grandfather, who worked for the CRB under Hoover. Jeff's enthusiasm for the project uh, was evident and contagious. I, I caught some of that. Uh, over the years, he has researched and written not just one book, but two books on the CRB. The first, Behind the Lines, which I cannot hold up because it's in my home library, appeared to critical, critical acclaim in 2014. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to it's always with me. <laughs> <laughs> some carry a Bible. <laughs> um, uh, the book told the story of the early days of the CRB from October to December of 1914. It was a darn good book, uh, providing insights into the many men and women, uh, Belgian, American, German, French, English, uh, who worked to feed and to impede the feeding of Belgian, of the Belgian nation in the first months of the war. The second book, World War I Crusaders, continues the saga, carrying the story through the end of the war, the armistice, and beyond. I use the word saga deliberately because World War I Crusaders is an epic story of heroic achievements. Uh, working at the Hoover Library, I've been telling this story for 15 years. The story of Herbert Hoover, the Commission for Relief of Belgium, and the man who fed a nation. And I realize that's pretty, a pretty narrow focus because Herbert Hoover did not act alone. What Jeff has done is flesh this story out. It's not just Hoover. It's the men and women on the ground. It's the men and women in America, in London, in Lille, in Antwerp, in, in, in Brussels in Paris, in London, hammering out the ongoing negotiations to feed a nation. Um, his attention to detail is outstanding. The devil is in those details. And in telling these particular and individual stories, uh, here Jeff Miller shines. Uh, he introduces the reader to so many players, uh, large and small, heroic, venal, uh, and villainous. And unfurls a gripping yarn that gives each player their due. The Bunga Sisters. Did I get that right? Close. <laughs> English is my first language. Anything else I just felt. Hugh Gibson, Joe Green, Milton Brown, his, his grandfather, Winston Churchill, Walter Hines Page, that guy named Hoover. Uh, dozens and dozens of characters, all defined and fully fleshed out in a story that is dramatic, compelling, uh, revealing all their human foibles, all their human ambitions, and, you know, uh, he makes, you, he makes you feel their frustration when they fail, or when they're thwarted. He makes you feel their pride when they succeed. Uh, it's, it's this ability that Jeff has to engage the reader. That's his special skill, and he deploys it to great effect in this book. Uh, Jeff has said to me on more than one occasion, he doesn't feel that he's a historian, that, that as if all of, um, because he's not trained as a professional historian. What he is is a damn good writer who does history, and that makes him a historian in my estimation. By the end of his research, there are over 3,000 endnotes in this book, and his thoughtfully constructed narrative fitting the kaleidoscopic tales of Antwerp, Brussels, London, uh, and France into a coherent story. He's done what all historians aspire to do, create a book that makes history vibrant and alive. Uh, World War I Crusaders is a solid work of history. It can sit on the shelf next to George Nash and feel no no need to shrink. Uh, it's a legacy that Jeff can take pride in, and a fitting tribute to your, to your grandparents who are part of this story. I'm not alone in my assessment. I, I, I'm a big fan of Jeff's work, but uh, Kirkus Reviews, which is a legitimate library review source, has given World War I Crusaders a star review, which is given to less than 7% of the books published in any one year. Kirkus said, and here I quote, this is a tour de force of history. A magnum opus that celebrates compassion, honor, and humanitarian virtue. His praise is merited. I would not be surprised to see World War I Crusaders garner additional awards in the future. But for the present, I am content to have World War I Crusaders on my bookshelf. I, will, I expect to consult frequently with questions about Belgium and World War I. And I want to encourage all of you to do the same. 
get it on your bookshelf. It's a worthy read, uh, and it's available in the gift shop, $24.95. On a per page basis, probably the best deal in our gift shop. Uh, and Jeff will be available to sign the books afterwards, after this presentation. Now, I give it Jeff now. Thank you, Matt. I really would like to meet the guy you just described. <laughs> <laughs> this is my book of the mirror. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you all for showing up tonight. Um, when um, Tom Schwartz asked me to come speak here tonight, when he sent an email and asked me to come speak, I had told him I would be very happy to, but I tell all my, all my friends no that I am one of those people who will never turn down an opportunity to talk to a captive audience because I'm a ham at heart. Tom emailed back, Iowa loves ham. That's why we're the number one corn producing state. So I found a home. I feel really great here tonight. So thank you. Also, that's a good reference to what we're going to speak about tonight, which is food, but in a lot more serious way. I'd like to start off by asking a rhetorical question of you is, for almost a hundred years, when civilians anywhere in the world have been threatened by a natural disaster or by world conflict, by war and conflict, what is the one thing that everybody thinks about right away in, the, in, in nearly the last hundred years? It's America will help. It's the first thing everybody thinks about anywhere in the world today. That wasn't the case before World War I. And it was Herbert Hoover who had a lot to do with changing the way the world saw America and the way that we see ourselves on the world stage. So it's hard for some people today to believe this about the 31st president of the United States who's blamed for the Great Depression, that the people of the world thought of him as the great humanitarian. They called him the great humanitarian. His fall from grace has been extremely well documented, but his rise to initial greatness really has been forgotten during this World War I. I'm here tonight to talk to you about the amazing feats he accomplished in World War I. To start with, let's hope I work this correctly, historians generally agree that approximately 9 million soldiers died from 1914 to 1918. During those same years, 10 million Belgians and people from northern France were who were trapped behind German lines were fed every day by Herbert Hoover's Commission for Relief in Belgium, or CRB. The CRB, along with its counterpart in Belgium, called the CN, or Committee Nationale, they fed these 10 million people every single day. Here are a few facts about the CRB that might impress you. And I promise I won't go too much into facts today, but it was the largest food relief drive the world had ever seen. More than 5 million tons of materials shipped and distributed. Nearly one billion 1914 dollars were spent, which if you compare that with the Panama Canal, which opened in 1914 and was the largest U.S. construction project, that only cost 400 million dollars. Every day, for four years, nearly 50 ships were on the high seas at some point in the process of carrying food to Rotterdam, where then it was transferred onto canal barges and taken into Belgium. So, um, it was an incredible feat, especially because it was taking place during the greatest war the world had ever seen. And remember, it was 100 years ago, without fax machines, without TV, without radio, without internet. There was nothing that we take for granted today. The entire operation was started and supervised by Herbert Hoover and a small group of Americans. But before I get into the, that story, I need to kind of set the stage a little bit. Here is the map of 1914 Europe. And you can see between France and, oh, and I remember now I have a, oh, I have one of these. It's so exciting. Look out, everybody. Watch out, airplanes. Anyway, uh, France, between France and, and Germany, there is this little country wedged in between, which is, which is Belgium. Belgium had been a land that had been owned by other countries for decades, for centuries and centuries. And it was only became its own country in 1830, which was less than 100 years before the First World War. So this was a new country that had been created. And out there, there had been the Treaty of London in 1839, which established Belgium's neutrality, just like Switzerland's. 
so that all of Europe had signed this treaty, all of the big powers had signed this treaty saying, we will honor Belgium's neutrality. So what was Belgium like before the war? Pre-war Belgium was seven and a half million residents, small in the country of the size, smaller of the state of Maryland. It was the most industrialized country in Europe. And highest density, look at this, 652 people per square mile, when in the United States at the time, there were 31 people per square mile. And it imported more than 75% of its food, of its daily food, and imported more than 78% of its cereals. And I promise those are the last big statistics I'll give you tonight. I'm not going to do a lot of them on that. But why do I list cereals anyway? As most of you probably know, cereals are what are used to make bread. And bread was a critical part of Belgium. Here is, to the Belgian, bread is not only the staff of life, it is its legs. Americans think of bread as something that goes with the rest of the meal. To the poor classes of Belgians, the rest of the meal goes with bread. So, now that I've set the stage a little bit, on August 1914, August 4th, 1914, as you probably, most of you know, Germans invaded Belgium and to get to their real goal, which was France. Immediately, civilians were thrown into upheaval. They were overwhelmed by the Germans. And then it began a very harsh occupation. The occupation was, at the beginning, no cars, no buses, no trains were allowed, no telephones or telegrams, no mail, newspaper, all communications with the outside world was totally shut down. And you couldn't even travel between um, from one town to another, or even outside of your neighborhood in a big city without getting approval from the Germans. This basically meant it's a return to medieval times, um, which is a pretty horrible thing to think about, even back then. The Germans wanted and demanded complete control of Belgian life. And here we have a translation of a German placard that, would go, that went up all over the country. And this translation, um, was placed all over Belgium, and as it says, the residents couldn't even dig up potatoes without consent. And anyone going anywhere without permission would be shot. As a, so that's what it was like. It was total control of your life. As a food situation, um, as to the food situation, it was bad and it was starting to get worse. Germans had refused to feed the Belgians. The British blockade the German territories to try to starve Germany. Industrial Belgium is completely shut down. And remember, they were the most industrialized country in Europe. So most people were out of work as well. Most crops are lost, bread lines formed. One of those with a front row seat to all of this was Bran Whitlock. And Bran Whitlock was the US Minister of the Legation in Brussels. And what he said was, we began to note a new phenomenon, new at least to Brussels. Women begging in the streets, hunger, another of war's companions had come to town. As things got worse in Belgium, it's important to note that the Belgians were not sitting idly, waiting for the inevitable starvation to begin. All across the country, local committees and, and wealthy Belgians began to come together and assess the situation. They realized that they needed to find food, and they petitioned the Germans to allow them to go out of Belgium to go and try to find some food. By far, the largest such group was formed in Brussels, and it was under the leadership of Belgian Emile Franqui. And Franqui, <clears throat> when he started the group, he also had a few, few of the US personnel from the legation who were in there as well, in their, their committee. Within a short period of time, this committee then realized the war would last a lot longer than everyone had expected. So all these little smaller groups all around Belgium, trying to find food for each of their little areas, all came together under Emile Franqui, and they all came together under the Committee, Committee Nationale, I call it, because I can't pronounce half the rest of the words there. But <laughs> it means, hey, it's a committee of help, and, and um, it was run by uh, <coughs> Emile Franqui. Uh, and, let's see, uh, the CN sent an American his name was Schaller, to go and find food. He went to Holland to try to find food, to buy food there. And, got the, and the Dutch said, sorry, we don't have it. So he ends up in England. 
where he ends up talking to Herbert Hoover. But I'll get to that in a second. Before I get to that story, though, it's important to remember what was happening in August of 1914. What happens every August? And I'll let you think about that for a moment while I have a sip of water. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anybody want to take a guess? What happens in August? Harvest? It's summer vacation. There's a, there's a peak of European summer vacation. 100,000 plus Americans are trapped in Europe because they're caught in the middle of the war. All transportation, communications, everything is shut down. They can't get anywhere anymore. Most transatlantic services have been suspended as well. And spontaneous relief efforts start up by wealthy Americans who are overseas, living overseas, say, we'll help. We'll try to find a way to help these people. <coughs> so, um, now remember, the United States had already, in August, had already declared its neutrality and would stay neutral for three years, almost three years of the war. So American travelers were neutral. Therefore, they could get out of occupied zones if they could only find the financing or the transportation or whatever help to get out. Wealthy Americans living overseas, as I said, helped started to organize efforts for these stranded tourists. In London, one major American emerged figure, Herbert Hoover. Now, before I go on, doesn't he look like somebody in today's Hollywood? Anybody want to take a guess? I'm going that day. Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, okay. Back to Hoover. Back to Hoover. Sorry. Anyway, so he's 40 years old. He's just turned 40 years old in 1914. He's living in London, a multi-millionaire engineer, mining engineer. He also wants to serve the public. He's trying to decide between, he's been offered the presidency of Stanford University, where he had been in the first class at Stanford. And he was trying to decide on that, or to buy a newspaper. He was even thinking about buying a newspaper in America to then enter politics, because that's how some people got into politics, was you bought a newspaper and then used that as your organ to get your message across as to here's who I am. Um, he, offices, he offers his services to these U.S. tourists, and his group ends up becoming the dominant group about all, all, uh, in that str those stranded tourists. But in late September, early October, when he's now wrapping up, finishing all the tourist situation, helping them, he talks to Shallard. Remember, Shallard is the American who's come from Belgium, who's trying to buy food. And Shallard tells him all about the conditions in Belgium. Hoover is in constant touch also with the American Embassy, with Walter Page, who is the U.S. Ambassador. And because they're trying to do everything they can to help American tourists as well. But remember, they've been, they've been declared neutral. So the U.S. cannot officially be helping any of the Belgians who are actually now belligerents as part of the war. They're part of the Allied forces. So, um, so Hoover, a private citizen of a neutral country, decides he is going to help the Belgians. He forms the CRB on October 22, 1914. What he was attempting to do had never been done before. A private citizen of a, of a neutral country saving an entire nation from starvation that is caught in the middle of a world war. It had never been done before. The challenges were, of course, overwhelming. The CRB had to organize worldwide donations and funding, figure out how to spend that or find the money, buy the food around the world. Then they had to ship it to Rotterdam, as I had said before, where then they have to put that into canal barges and take it into Belgium, where the Committee Nationale, or CN, would then distribute the food. They had, in the end, the CN had 40,000 volunteers across the country. Because remember, trying to feed 7.5 million Belgians every day, you need a lot of people to be able to do all that work. They also had, the CRB had to guarantee the Germans would not take the food, and they had to get all the governments to agree to their whole plan. As if that wasn't enough, one more huge issue came up, which was pretty obvious. The English didn't trust the Germans. They said, well, hey, we don't care if the Germans say we're not going to touch the food. Of course they're going to steal the food. So the English say, you need to have Americans in Belgium supervising the operation so that we know that there are neutrals saying that the Germans are not taking the food. 
So it was a serious hurdle which led to Herbert Hoover's dilemma. And his dilemma was where he could where could he find US volunteers ready to drop everything, work for free, get into Ger go into German occupied Belgium, do a job that no one could explain in detail for an extended period of time. Uh, this was a real difficulty for him because he had immediately had he had recruited a lot of his friends who ended up becoming executives in the CRB. But he needed boots on the ground people. He needed people who right away could drop everything and go into Belgium. Where could he find people like that? Right away, because it would take weeks if not months to recruit people from America and then come over on ocean oil. Before he could organize efforts to recruit experienced Americans from back home, um, he found two different ways of finding volunteers. The first was simply serendipity. And serendipity that by the middle to late November of 1914, about 10 or 15 Americans had kind of floated into the CRB like driftwood onto a beach and had become part of the you know, informal CRB delegates, they were called. CRB delegates were the people who went into Belgium and supervised the operations to make sure the Germans did not take the food to close. One example is a guy I'd love to have a beer with, E.E. E. Hunt. He was 29 years old, Harvard grad. He had worked in the city of New York on American Magazine, and then when the war broke out, he became a freelance war correspondent. He survived the three-day bombardment of Antwerp and walked with the refugees into Holland. He was this great, sensitive journalist, a great guy. He heard about the CRB through the American Embassy staff in Holland, and he went into Belgium in November to look at it, and then in December decided to sign up, and he decided to get rid of being a journalist and become part of the CRB. So, um, can you guess the second place? Did you know that I was going to ask you all these questions? <laughs> yeah, the second place. Any idea about where you could get a bunch of volunteers in England right away to do this work? College. Very good. Very good. Oxford University. The Rhodes Scholar Program. There is a bunch of students about to leave for six weeks winter break. And they hear about uh, the guy over here, Perrin Galpin. He read about the CRB and Hoover's need for people. And he writes to Hoover and says, and we help. And Hoover jumped at the chance, of course. And they, after Hoover said, yes, we like people, he got together a group of Americans, and the first 10 Americans um, signed up as being to, to be CRB delegates. As you can imagine, this spoke very much deeply to these students on wanting to help other people and also their spirit of adventure. I mean, think about it. No one knew what was really happening in German-occupied Belgium because there was no news coming in or out. And the Germans had shut the whole country down. So, and these were Americans who knew their country was neutral, but this was a way they could help out and be a part of the war without actually fighting. At the time, no one had any idea what conditions were like in Belgium or what delegates were supposed to do when they got there. Emil Holloman, who is not pictured here, but he became a CRB delegate. He said, and I love this quote, we had visions of sitting on top of boxcars or sleeping on the decks of small canal barges in their long journeys from Rotterdam into Belgium. We expected to see German savages prowling around ready at the slightest provocation to scalp women and children and perhaps provoke a quarrel with us for the same purpose. So they had no idea what to expect and what they were going to do. One of the Oxford students was 19 years old. Think about it, going into the uh, prison of Belgium to face war-hardened German officers and conservative Belgian businessmen. Say that a few times, that's a tough one. Um, it's a great story, and it's one you just can't make up. This, this is incredible, these students going in to try to do this work. And their experiences while in Belgium were as varied as their own personalities. In most cases, that's because they created the job as they went along. Uh, adapting to local conditions and interpreting instructions from the CRB London office, the CRB Rotterdam office, the CRB Brussels office, and the demands of the Committee Nationale, the Belgian officials, and German officers. That is six bosses 
Then if you add Hoover onto it, it's seven bosses these four guys had. It's a wonder that anything got accomplished. But if you knew, if you knew Hoover and you knew some of the other Americans and Belgians who got involved in this, you would know that very quickly they would take the chaos and make it, they would, they would straighten out the chaos and get this thing going. As to some individual stories, here's one I think is really illuminating. And we happen to have the son of David T. Nelson here tonight, John Nelson and his wife. Thank you so much for coming, sir. I really appreciate it. He helped in providing the research for his father. And was, he was kindly gave me uh, his journal so that I could use the journal in the book. And David T. Nelson is a big part of this book. The first book and the second book, both. I used both of them. He was 23, year old, 23 years old in 1914. Born and raised in North Dakota, taught in a one-room schoolhouse. Even. And in the summer of 1914, he goes around saying goodbye to all of his friends on his Indian motorcycle before he goes off to Oxford. And he arrives in Oxford in early October. This was, an, as you probably know, he was an independent, self-reliant kind of American who felt he could achieve anything if he just puts his mind to it. He was, I really love this guy. As a young man, I don't know what he was like as an older guy, but I really liked him as a young man. He reflected much of what the country was like back then as well. We had just finished the Panama Canal. We felt like we could do anything. It's kind of that confidence that comes before you're truly tested or truly taught, tried in certain crises. As for Nelson, it was right up his alley to go wander into a potentially dangerous situation. He had no idea what was going on, what he was supposed to do, and figure it out on his own. He jumped at the chance to join the CRB and was one of the first 10 Oxford students into Belgium. But Nelson's entry into Belgium, as you know, was, was quite a difficult one. Here is his, it just, oh, and so on the Saturday evening, December 5th, he arrives with his nine other fellow students in Rotterdam, and on Monday he's assigned to be sole delegate in Liège, Belgium. So, here's how he got there, though. He takes the train from Rotterdam to the Dutch border town of Maastricht. He learns suddenly the station masters say they won't allow an upcoming food train to go through into Belgium. So without anyone to consult, nobody tell him what to do. He says, I'm going to go confront those station masters, and I'm going to convince them to let this train through. So he finds a guy who, will, um, who speaks, as he said, speaks English, Dutch, French, and German, because you need all those to deal with a Dutch official. He did not like Dutch officials. He was not too keen on those. So he convinces the station masters to allow the train through. When it, com when it comes in, he's going to, they are going to allow it to go into Belgium. But the station masters say, you can't ride the train yourself. He can't find another car ride. And his suitcase is too heavy to carry for the five to 10 miles that he has to walk to get into Belgium. So he leaves it with the station masters and hope it's going to be forwarded on to him. So think about this. It is a cold Wednesday afternoon, December 9th, 1914, as the sun is getting low in the sky. Nelson, without a suitcase and only the clothes on his back and his passport and his permission to get into Belgium, starts his lonely walk towards occupied Belgium, having no idea what he's about to face. He was probably wishing he had his motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> two, others, two other Oxford students had it a lot easier. These two were Tracy Kittredge on the left and, um, and Richard Simpson on the right. Kittredge, uh, excuse me, I have to turn the page, sorry. Um, they were actually driven to their their hotel. They immediately began working, contacting city officials, venturing out into the province, and setting up their office. Kittredge wrote a history of the CRB after the fact, and in it he wrote, he explained that these are the things they had to do. Number one, they had damaged canals to be cleared of sunken bridges and barges. Remember, the war had gone through, so all these barges had been, all these canals had been damaged. Barge lightermen, those are the canal people who run the canal boats, to be controlled and intimidated into obeying orders. Warehouses and depots to be installed. Remember, there's going to be millions of tons of food coming through there. They had to be uh, protected. 
communications to be established with the provinces and with Brussels. There was no communication. So the CRB men, who were allowed to travel from place to place in Belgium, helped to re-establish communications between places in Belgium. So they served a great purpose that way. They had to have the mills to be controlled, because the mills had to grind the wheat to make it into flour, for the bread. They had bakers to be constrained in living up to their contracts. Bakers were notorious thieves, and so they had to make sure <laughs> Belgian, Belgian bakers, everyone knew that. So even the Belgians admitted that themselves. That systems of distribution, administration form, ration cards to be realized and put into effect. All of that done. They had local committees to be organized and induced to distribute food according to instructions, and complaints to be investigated and difficulties with the Germans to be smoothed out. Now remember, these are college students who are trying to do all this. Most of them are at the time. Um, with great understatement, Kittredge ends it with, the task was a formidable one. <laughs> but what would be a delegate's biggest, most important task? Arguably, it was somehow to remain absolutely neutral. Hoover understood that neutrality was the linchpin of the CRB. Without the neutrality, the English wouldn't believe that this was going on, the Germans wouldn't believe them either, and they'd shut down the operation. So he would have liked all the CRB men to be neutral both in act and uh, both in thought and in action. But he knew he was dealing with passionate young men which is pretty hard, uh, to keep them constrained when they were watching the Belgians under this harsh German rule. So, according to a journalist friend of his, Hoover told the first ten, remember the first ten Oxford students in December who were going to go over from London, Hoover sat down with them on December 5th, and here's what he said. You must forget that the greatest war in history is being waged. You have no interest in it other than the feeding of the Belgian people, and you must school yourselves to a realization that you have to us and to your country a sacred, op sacred obligation of absolute neutrality in every word and deed. As Hoover struggled to ensure that his CRB delegates remained neutral, and that was no easy task with these young men, think about it. Hoover also had to contend with numerous opponents to the concept of, of relief, Belgian relief. He had a formidable list of opponents lined up against the CRB. First, there was, drum roll please, the British military, uh, most notably represented by Lord Kitchener, who was the Secretary, uh, see, Secretary of State for War, who was his title and somebody you'll get to know later in the Second World War, a young Winston Churchill, who was the, Lord, he was the first Lord of the Admiralty in charge of the Navy. They thought that any help given to the Belgians would prolong the war. And they even said in private, they said, frankly, we wouldn't mind if there's food riots in Belgium, because that would mean the Germans would have to take soldiers off the front lines of the Western Front to be able to control those people. So they never said that publicly, but they said it privately to a lot of people and tried to shut down the CRB all the time. They even had spies, Winston Churchill had spies in Belgium trying to catch the CRB screwing up, you know, or the Germans taking the food or something like that. Um, that uh, as for, as for um, as if that wasn't enough in terms of opposition, there was one more surprising opposition to it, and that was the German military. They also felt, they felt for different reasons, they said, we don't want neutral Americans running around our new country, Belgium, because they're Allied spies. We know they're for the Allies. We're sure of it. So they didn't want it either. And finally, so, um, then, oh, sorry. And finally, there was one major other opponent to relief, which came from a very surprising group. Anybody? Okay. It's, it's late. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to it. The Belgians themselves, mm -hmm. certain ones, okay? As in, there was a small group, a very small group of Belgians, led by one man, Emile Franqui, the head of the CN. Justifiably, understandably, Franke and some of the other members of the CN, they really felt the entire relief effort could be done by them. 
there was no reason for the Americans to be there, they felt. And they felt that they could handle everything. And if the CRB stayed out of Belgium and just simply bought the food and sent it to them, they could take care of everything else. Hoover's continual and constant response to this Belgian line of reasoning was two things. That the Germans would not allow, um, that the Germans would not take the, oh, excuse me, sorry, sorry, I slipped. So he said, Herbert Hoover said that the only, um, the reason it was that the British had entrusted only the Americans to the two guarantees. And the two guarantees were that the Germans would not take the food and that the food would be evenly distributed throughout Belgium. And the English felt the Belgians, because they were under the yoke of the Germans, would never be able to guarantee that because they were not neutral and they were not separate and individual. So it was only, the English kept saying, we'll shut it down. If you leave Belgium, Herbert Hoover, if you leave Belgium, we're going to shut it down. You have to stay because you're the only people who can guarantee the two things. Guarantee the Germans will not take the food and guarantee that it will be evenly distributed among all of the Belgians. But how did Hoover handle the military operation, the opposition? Remember the two sets of military? He knew that the, um, he knew the only way for the food relief to continue was if he had one thing on his side. And oh, excuse me. And I had forgotten to hit the button here, but this was basically he had felt relief could be done by them, and there was no need for the delegates. But now, so I'm sorry, it's it's late. I'm slowing down myself. Worldwide public opinion. That's what Hoover felt he needed to have. It was absolutely important to have that. Way before the understanding of manipulation of the media, Hoover understood the tremendous power of public opinion and how to manipulate the press to get that public opinion. He knew that if the story of Belgium was always in, uh, in the news and people always hearing about Belgium, that then they would get, they would feel as if they were part of the Belgians and that they needed to help the Belgians. His public opinion and media campaign included enlisting journalist friends, of course, to help him join the CRB or to write about it. He created a press bureau to generate continual coverage all over the world, but mostly in the United States, and asking famous people to write about Belgium and Belgian relief, and also creating U.S. state and local committees that were Belgian relief committees. He understood the power of people saying, if I every week go to my local committee to help Belgian relief by doing something, it makes me engaged in Belgium, and I want to then find out what happens to Belgium. I want to keep that in mind. So the tremendous worldwide opinion that he was able to get kept him through most of the crises and the conflicts that happened, so that when, when the English um, when the German military and the English military were really trying to shut down uh, by putting pressure on the civilian governments to do so, whoever was able to use public opinion to make sure that the civilian governments did not shut it down. In a few cases, though, Hoover, though, had a final last-ditch weapon that he used sparingly, but always effectively, when worldwide opinion, when that card didn't work, he had one last ditch effort that he had. And I'll use a sports analogy, an old sports analogy, to describe it. The best defense is an offense. Hoover might have found inspiration for the last ditch weapon from this man, French General Ferdinand Foch, who said, and I love this, at the Battle of the Marne, you know that you know this quote last, I know you do. At the Battle of the Marne, September 1914, during the worst of the fighting, when it all seemed lost, this French general said, my center is giving way, my right is in retreat, situation excellent, I shall attack. And that's how he handled what Hoover did was, while Hoover didn't have to face physical fighting, he did have to face the treacherous attacks from all sides on all the conditions, uh, from all the different opponents. He had to, these challenges included British proof that the Germans were taking the food. The CRB had to shut down. That was one of the things that happened quite often. 
German major restrictions on CRB delegates so they couldn't do their jobs. And then the English would say, no, we're going to shut you down. If, the, if your delegates cannot do the work, we think we need to shut you down. Franqui's statements that the CR, uh, CRB was not needed in Belgium, that the CN could do the job. Hoover countered each of these with documentation, expert testimony, sound reasoning, and common sense. And when all else failed, as they did a handful of times, Hoover used the last, last ditch weapon I was telling you about. And he announced sadly, reluctantly, that, okay, we quit. And he would say to anybody, once he couldn't soundly explain his way out of a, a, of a problem, he would say, okay, we're going to pull out, we're going to leave. And suddenly, everybody would change their tune and say, oh, oh no, please stay. Even Emile Franqui, who wanted desperately to see Hoover leave, anytime Hoover said this, Franqui would come out publicly and go, oh, I love the guy, he's got to stay, we have to convince him to stay. I frankly don't know why he didn't go along with this, seriously. Um, anyway, so speaking of quitting, I should be kind of trying to wrap up now a little bit. But um, I want to say that though after decades of research and of writing, and you know some of that, you've helped me a lot in this institution, has helped me a great deal. Um, I firmly believe that this incredible food relief could never have been done without that incredible focus of that one man, Herbert Hoover. Uh, but in late 1914, as the CRB men came together and found their way into Belgium and began to interact with the Belgians also working on relief, the chaos and confusion of the situation was nearly as great as behind the lines as it was in the trenches. It was a whole new world of warfare and it was a whole new world, it was becoming a whole new world of relief as well, of humanitarian aid. And no one knew how best to approach either one of these. Thankfully, the helm on the American side of the release was Herbert Hoover. Not only a great humanitarian, but a great organizer. And thankfully, on the Belgian side, there was a distribution network that was set up that really was able to produce the results it did. Just, import, just as importantly though, there were the boots on the ground, little known men and women who heeded the call to save a nation from starvation. With no expectation of anything in return, they simply did what they did because it was the right thing to do morally and ethically. It was not a transactional situation, it was we need to help because we can help and we will help. They are as much the story of the CRB as Herbert Hoover is and Emile Franqui. Which leads me to mention one last quick story. Approximately 185 men and one woman were CRB delegates in Belgium. And I say approximately because it's surprising there is no one official record that says here's the 185 guys. Any list has some errors, some omissions, some kinds of problems with it. Um, regardless of the exact number of the CRB delegates though, one of them I knew intimately, and I would be remiss if I did not mention him now. And this is my grandfather, Milton M. Brown. He was born and raised in Cincinnati, graduated from Princeton in 1913, was a travel lecturer on the Chautauqua circuit that was around in the United States back then, before joining the CRB, and he entered Belgium in January of 1916. While he was in Belgium, he fell in love with a Belgian girl who was also working on relief, Erica Bunga. Is Bunga. Anyway, Erica Bunga, she was, her father was the Antwerp merchant, Edouard Bunga, who had started the Bunga Corporation, which is still in existence today and on the New York Stock Exchange. She and her father, uh, Edouard Bunga, they began a dairy farm that then, by the end of the war, had produced one million liters of milk for the children of Antwerp. Mm -hmm. Every day, they would come out, they would, uh, they had a farm that was outside of Antwerp, and every day, they would take the wagons in, they had people who brought the milk into Antwerp and gave it to the children. So, happily, she fell in love with Milton M. Brown, thankfully for me, and they married after the war. And so they became my grandparents. When my grandparents died, I inherited all their diaries, journals, correspondence, and my grandmother had even taken photos, 
100 years before of this time with these CRB delegates. And interestingly enough, she fell in love with one of the delegates before my grandfather. But happily, that didn't work out. So <laughs> that was in the years before my grandfather showed up. So anyway, um, I spent two full-time years on the CRB in the 1980s, back before the internet, when I still had to write to institutions like this asking for information. I had to come here, or I had to go, I went to libraries, Princeton and Yale, and I went to Stanford, I've been to a lot of different places as well, going through old boxes. People today, a lot of the younger generation today, don't realize that not everything is on the internet. It's a real shock to them. It's like, no, no, some things are really, you can't find on the, well, no, yes I can. So no, you can't. You can't find certain things. Anyway, so um, I then spent two years in the 1980s researching and writing an uh, 850-page historical novel about this story. And sadly, it's never been in print because my strength is nonfiction. It's not fiction, sadly. My agent told me that. He goes, stick with the nonfiction, Jeff. You're much better at that than you are fiction. In 2012, I committed to full-time researching and writing a nonfiction book about the CRB, which then did morph into two books. Uh, Behind the Lines, this was my first book, it was published in October 2014, told the complex story of the beginning of the CRB, as Matt was saying, from August to December of 1914. I then spent three full-time years researching and writing my new book, World War I Crusaders, which you've already seen. Matt, thank you for holding up. Um, when, and, and that goes from August, as it says there in the bottom, you can't read it, but August 1914 until May 1917. May 1917 is the last of the American delegates had to leave Belgium because of the April 1917 entry of America into the war. So it took a month before the Germans finally said, okay, you got to go, and, and the Americans said, we have to leave. But Hoover was so well respected that the Germans agreed and the English agreed to allow him to keep running the CRB from London. And they got Spanish, uh, the, the Spanish were neutral and the Dutch were neutral. So they got Spanish delegates and Dutch delegates to come in and take the place of the American, Americans at the time. While my grandfather, while my grandparents, Erica Bunga and Milton M. Brown, are both in the books, these books are not about my family. My family is a thread, the tapestry of these books. I'd like to end my presentation with a quote from the end of the epilogue of World War I Crusaders. It shows you where my true focus and my true heart lies in this. Most of the CRB delegate stories have been long forgotten. Innocent victims swept away by the tidal wave of negative public opinion surrounding Hoover's later efforts as president. Because Hoover is perceived as having been a bad president, much of his great humanitarian work and the work of those associated with the relief have been neglected. Their stories deserve to be told and remembered. Thank you for being here tonight and thank you for listening. To me. And before anybody has a question, here's some real quick ones. This is just real fast if we had time. This is Erica Bunga is up on the right. She was a nurse back then, and she took care of the badly wounded and badly burned victims. She took that photo as well. And then she had a lot of different relief efforts. This is just, I wanted to, here was their farm. This was their actual dairy farm in operation. This was my great-grandfather, Edward Bunga. So he did a lot for the CRB, I'll, I'll let that go. So that's it. So, somebody, oh, you're still awake, so thankfully. I uh, yes. helped with uh, a diary. Oh, well, actually, they were a collection of letters sent from one of the guys. Yes, to, yes. To, to his mom in New York City. And he mentioned only one instance of a uh, black marketeer in one location, and they took care of it. But I don't know who they were. Was it the Belgian police? Uh, oh, and that's a really good question. Is um, the Belgian police were allowed to still function in German occupied by Belgium, but only on very limited. And they ended up those 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 policemen were only supposed to handle little incidences, little things happening in towns and villages, keeping the peace. 
they ended up being really good subversives who worked against the Germans. These these were cops, you know, they, and and their true heart lay in their own country. So they did a lot of things to look the other way when they saw other Belgians doing something against the Germans, which was nice. But to answer your question, though, when it came to a problem with the food relief, um, the CRB delegates had to officially alert the Germans and the Belgians both. Okay, and then the Belgians and, and um, they, the Belgians had their own little court system where they would actually bring bakers to trial, or they would do other thi you know, other things that were, if it wasn't a huge infraction of some kind or another, the Germans allowed the Belgians to deal with it themselves. The most severe situations, if they were turned in, and it was really against something against the Germans, the Germans would take it to their own court system and they would throw them in jail. They would, and they were pretty harsh about that. And they took over a lot of those kinds of things. Um, so I hope that answered. Who was it? Who was it? You? Uh, Fred Eckstein. Uh, oh, oh, Fred Eckstein. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. I, I have to tell this story real quick then. Excuse me. Do you know? Do you know what his name? Their family name is today. No. This is really. Uh, Fred Eckstein was a guy from Princeton. I know. I know all about Fred, and because he goes into Belgium, and there were three Bunga girls. There was. Eva, Hilda, and Erica. And so Erica, my grandfather, marries. Fred Eckstein gets involved with Eva Bunga. And they get engaged. And I'm reading this in the 1980s, before the internet. I'm reading this in one of, the, one of my grandfather's correspondence back home to his family in Ohio. He says, my friend, Fred Eckstein, has just gotten engaged to Eva Bunga. And I knew Eva Bunga had never married a guy named Fred Eckstein. So I was like, who's this Fred Eckstein guy? You know, I want to find out more about him. So I start trying to research him. But remember, it's before the internet. He disappears after the war. He totally disappears. He's just gone. I can't find him in any records. I'm having the worst time. And then coincidences of life. This is incredible. I go, this is 1986. Go to the Princeton Library. I'm doing research there. And they send me to an annex to get some photos from the CRB days. I go to the Princeton annex, and there's a woman behind the desk there, the information desk, and she wasn't even supposed to be there that day, but her, her staff person had gotten sick, so she had to be there. This was the only day I was there. I show up and I hand her the information. I say, I'd like to have this information. She goes, oh, the CRB, the Commission for Relief in Belgium. I go, how do you know that? I mean, no one knows about the CRB. She goes, my great uncle was in it. I go, well, who was your great uncle? She goes, a guy named Fred Exton. Oh, Exton. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, wait. I go, could his name have originally been Exton? She goes, how do you know that? <laughs> and so we got together. We started talking. And I told her the story. And she goes, so she's your family's one. She goes, the family story always was that this Belgian girl had, had dumped him. And he ends up marrying this French girl, and this is the direct quote, that made his life miserable for 50 years. <laughs> and so, 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 so I, <laughs> rather than a Belgian, right? Rather than a Belgian. Anyway, so Fred X, and I'm sorry I'm taking this so long on this, but so it's fascinating because I can't believe you just brought that up. But what happened was uh, when he had to leave uh, Belgium, he, he was given the choice to go home. He was given a thousand bucks. Yeah. But he took the money and he stayed in France so that he would, he was always looking for an opportunity. He was trying to make connections so that when after the war, he would, you know, get a job somewhere. Yeah. He was yeah. a young guy. Uh, he became an intelligence officer, but he was separated from his, um, because of the, uh, you know, the Western Front, right. couldn't visit it, and he wasn't getting letters, his fiance, And then he finally met up at the end of the war. It's like he was a stranger to her. Right. He, she gave him pretty much the cold shoulder. That's Eva Booker. And and because I've read the papers here as well, that they're here. And that he anglicized, he wrote to his mother explaining why he changed his name. And it was the Germanness of Eckstein. Everybody in America, there was such dislike of the Germans to, to be kind about it after the First World War. And so a lot of 
Germans or people with German sounding names anglicized their names. And so that's why I had lost him in the 1980s without the internet. I lost him completely because he went from Eckstein to Sudden Laxton. It was like, whoa, where'd he go? So anyway, so he's in my book. I, I write about him in Eva. So anyway. Yes, sir. So Luxembourg must have been caught up in this too, but you don't read much about it. Can you just comment on that? And sadly, I don't know. My, yes, it was. And it was all part of that whole, they were neutral as well. And I have no, I, I'm at a total loss for words, which my wife would say is surprising. <laughs> because I don't know, my, I, I'm really, I have to say, I don't know anything about it. I, I, I wish I did. Now I know. I wish I did. Well, thank you all for coming. Really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you.